Okay. Okay, everyone, welcome to Saatchi's MFA Talks with Studio Art. It's wonderful to have everyone from far and wide, and we want to thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Kirsten Stromberg, and I am the program director for the MFA and Studio Art program at Saatchi. On our panel tonight are our five graduate candidates, Joe Semino, Eric Fry, you can wait, Aureus Medyard, Melissa Morris, and David Neal. Also, also on our panel is Steve Britton, the president of Saatchi, Reagan Wheat, who has been their core faculty in their studio practice seminar for the last two years, and Daria Filardo, who's also been their core faculty for the past two years in contemporary art practices, theory, and professional practice. Tonight, each of our MFA candidates will be sharing with you their recent work and the culmination of their research. In just nine days, these five candidates will be graduating. And this is an opportunity for you to see the nature of their research and what they're thinking about as they continue to move out into and with the world. These talks are in tandem with the group exhibition that also involves the, Sa the Sacha MFA programs in communication design and photography called Apprehensions in the Material World. They've installed their work at Sachi's Palazzo Madoff in Santa Gidio, which we hope will be open to visitors Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week, orange zone permitting. We're crossing fingers for Saturday morning news um, for those of you who are in Florence. So before the graduates begin, I'd like to pass the mic to Daria, who will talk a bit more about the exhibition. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kirsten. I have been um, the MFA instructor in the first and second year, uh, both in an academic path through the main debates of contemporary art and through the main challenges in the professional practice of an artist, so how to build up uh, the skills, uh, not, the, not the studio ones, uh, but the, the other ones, let's say from teaching to building a portfolio to doing, to do exhibitions and, and on and on. And uh, so we have been, you know, studying and growing all together. And the last act that we did was to install just yesterday, actually, and we will finish uh, the, tomorrow with the photography students, their last uh, collective exhibition. The collective exhibition is uh, called Apprehension of the Material World. And it's a very um, uh, perfect title for a program that it's been dominated by the pandemic that uh, the whole world is living. And that for sure has uh, influenced and uh, determined their, uh, the work and the mental state that we have all been living in. So the apprehension, it's kind of a state of mind for a world which is a fragile world uh, who has lost the equilibrium. And we are really trying to get all the pieces together to find again a path. And it's an apprehension for uh, um, a fragile state of mind and anxiety and, and difficulties in uh, carrying through all the everyday living and uh, um, in an uncertain future. It's an apprehension for uh, a model, an economic model, which has probably brought uh, at least uh, partially uh, what we are living today. So consequences, big consequences of an equilibrium that's lost. All of them have reacted throughout their path to this uh, very intense experience that we have all been living. And uh, all the works, as you will uh, see through the presentation and their very rich research has responded uh, greatly to the challenges. So I'm not going to talk about the work, obviously, because this is uh, the task of them. So I leave the word to Reagan, right? Or uh, no, to Kirsten. Right now we're going to pass. We're going to pass to the students okay. now. We're going to go for the them. Students. Reagan's going to ask questions and we'll talk a bit at the end. So we'll okay. have her join at the end. Um, so we're going to go alphabetically. We're going to start off with Joe. 
Um, I'm putting them on speaker view, so everyone please turn off your microphones so you can only see who's speaking. Um, there we go. Um, so I'd like to introduce Joe. Joe Cimino, or as we Italian Joe Cimino, I always call him that, is a time-based media artist whose work explores um, histories that remain overlooked in everyday life. And he highlights what lies in the peripheries in order to keep their traces safe for an uncertain future. Okay, let me just get my presentation ready here. Hello everybody. Thank you again, Kirsten, for that great introduction. My name is Joe Semino. I'm a time-based media artist. And today I'm gonna to be presenting my artistic research of late, which focuses on recognizing the unnoticed, or more specifically, what goes overlooked in our day-to-day -day lives? And what are those hidden histories that remain often in the peripheries? And so within my practice, I'm interested in focusing on this as my main topic. And by doing so, my, my works tend to manifest in different projects with different subject matter, but at the same time are all conceptually linked with this idea at the center. It's always pulling back. It's always the thing in the back of my mind when working and when presenting a project and just with threads these series of projects together that I'm going to be presenting here. And I wanted to start with a recent work of mine titled Monochromes, which is a series of four video and sound installations that deal with what is seen and unseen in the peripheries of our vision within the context of the American suburbs. And so the work looks to focus on the banal objects, environments, things that are often left to the background and are considered mundane and see what the histories of those things are. What's the context? What is the origins of these objects and how can it relate to our own context that we're living in currently? How can it relate to global crisis such as uh, global warming and, and, uh, and climate change? How can it relate back to rapid industrialization and consumer culture? Is this through looking at the suburban housing structure itself and its parasitic relationship to the cities that surround them or maybe in a pool pump, something often left as banal and similar within the context of suburbia, but very reminiscent of those exact industrial monolithic structures that riddle this landscape. But at the same time, it's also concerned with focusing on those moments that are very brief and very, you know, subtle and focusing on them a little bit longer and then slowing down to appreciate it, whether it's a light reflecting on the water or the shadows that ever slowly pass by. And so with moving to the context of the American suburbs, and in particular, this idea of the everyday routine, another work of mine titled The Midnight Drive is an audio work that utilizes the podcast format in order to, to play with the displacement of time, bringing the past and the future into an unknown present. And the work specifically focuses with this main story of driving and a radio DJ reaching out to us, the listener, and how it will be approached. But rather than get into the actual story of the work, I wanted to focus specifically within the context of my research and that of using the podcast format. So within my research, I've become interested in how familiar formats are both recognizable and familiar to us all, but then at the same time, how can they be utilized to experience a work of art? And so the Midnight Drive was created with the intent to be put online and is graciously hosted online by RadioProfessor.org and can be accessed at any time and anywhere. And this was very integral to the, to the concept of the piece, specifically by allowing one to have access to this work while going about their everyday routine, be it in driving in an actual car or being at home, walking around wherever you want it to be. And it becomes integral to the story itself, to what the message of the work is actually trying to show, that it's not necessarily what's in front of us that's always important, but sometimes and oftentimes it's really what is surrounding us what's happening on those peripheries and then how they can come to the center. And so within this context of the familiar format and utilizing something uh, or utilizing these formats, another work of mine is Never Saw Her Sad, which is a collection of seven trailers that revolve around this question of what happens to the stories of our families when no one is left to share them. So the work focuses on the story of my mother and that of her immigration story, a moving from Belgium to Sardinia, Italy at the age of four and into the United States from Sardinia at the age of 21, and it is narrated by her. Except it is left completely anonymous. There's no telling who this is, what is happening, where this is taking place, or really where these, who these people are that are displayed in it. 
And this was done so intentionally to promote this universal experience and re rely on the nostalgic and recognizable imagery of home videos and archival photographs from a family. And the work was put on the internet, specifically YouTube, under this name of Unknown Studios, which is one by my own creation and was intended to announce the arrival of this film, this grand experience that was going to come to theaters eventually, except the film does not exist and it never will. And what I find interesting with this is how, just like our own memories that we can never remember our own past or stories like a feature film, the, this work looks to act on that. And specifically by using the trailer, which is already a short story in and of itself that contains fragments of different moments in time, be it through the future or in the past and brings it all together, telling something, but then at the same time, never really expanding on it. And that's what this work is specifically dealing with and really focused on with both that concern and also that anxiety that comes with it. And returning back to the context of the suburb, a recent work of mine entitled Untitled Trees puts this question of what is valued and undervalued all around us right at the center and specifically within the context of my own childhood home, which I'm currently located at here in New Jersey um, in the United States and have recently been displaced back into uh, for unforeseen circumstances. And so upon arriving home, I began, I began to be fascinated and also curious with how a lot of the trees that were here before have been getting removed. And this in part having been happening while I was abroad in Italy. And upon doing research and becoming curious on, on wanting to put these trees back and finding their origins and finding where they were from, I began to search through my, my family's archives and to find traces of these trees wherever I could find them, be it in home videos or in photographs, and realized that these were being photographed in two ways, one of which specifically to show their removal, so a before and an after shot of what was cleared and removed, and the other to document the actual house itself, that these trees were subject to the background, that they weren't important or not considered on the edges of the composition, but in fact, we're getting in the way of what the photographer, probably my parents in this case, wanted to photograph, which would be either who was in front of the house or the house itself. And so I opted to bring these past photographs into present ones that, I take with, that I've taken with my camera after finding the photographs and trying to see how these could fit back together, but upon doing so, realizing that it never will match up exactly, because just like our, you know, how the past restricts us, we cannot bring what is lost back in. And in doing so with this work, it creates this timeless zone where the future and the past meet in this present moment, but are also unsure of themselves. And really it echoes this question of why does it take the loss of something for us to realize it's appreciate or realize um, to realize it and appreciate it. And at the same time, what are we not appreciating all around us that could disappear at any moment? And so with leading up to my research and everything that I've been working on and growing with particularly this idea of recognizing the unnoticed, what's in the background and the peripheries all around us, a recent work of mine that's also in the Saatchi Group Exhibitions, Apprehension of the Material World, titled American Landscapes, is a three channel video and sound installation that deals with the mythologization of, American, of the American West by specifically isolating the backgrounds of different Western genre films ranging from the 1950s to about 2018 and removes the main characters entirely. And so the, within this work, I became fascinated and curious about how the backgrounds within films, specifically Western films, can affect how we view the past. Can these, these landscapes, these constructed landscapes through cinematic language affect how we're viewing a time period, even though it's made to construct the narrative, now within the Western genre films, they're particularly focused on main characters, dialogues and what is happening and are also perpetuated by colonial and, um, and imperialistic viewpoints that dominate this field. And so by removing the main characters entirely and revealing these desolated landscapes, as well as utilizing sound in particular, which becomes another important element in the work to create a soundscape that calls back to this history of Western films, it becomes this curious examination of the difference in, in how through time these backgrounds have been represented, but then at the same time, how it is a construction in and of, it, in and of itself, calling back to historical American landscape painting, at the same time, motion picture industry, how landscape becomes something that is left 
to the background as a setting for really what is in front and that being the human. And in this case, through the traces of sounds, through the emphasis on the artificial creation of cinema and of really a deconstructed narrative, this work looks to examine that even further. And I think for me, that's really what my work has become focused on in recognizing the importance of these overlooked histories, overlooked banalities of everyday life and really recentering them in order to, to push my own perspective and to fill my own perspective, but as well as give context to the, to the entire global sphere around us. So I thank you all very much for your time and I will be passing you off to my colleagues here who will be presenting their works as well. So thank you again. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now introduce Eric Fry. Eric Fry is a phenomenological intermedia artist that focuses on the hidden humanity within a bureaucracy through the exploration of memory and the archives. He is a combat veteran and retired soldier who plans on teaching while working on his studio practice in Dallas, Oregon. Go for it, Eric. Please turn off your speakers for those who are not speaking. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning for those on the West Coast. Uh, as Kirsten said, my name is Eric Fry, and I deal with the phenomenological uh, experiences dealing with memory. So before I go into the full presentation, I want to give you a little bit of background on uh, what archival memories are about. Uh, from my personal experience as a child, I suffered from a traumatic brain injury, which affected how I remember things and how I process memories. Uh, and then later in life, I spent a career as a soldier, uh, mostly dealing with the bureaucratic aspects of human resources and logistics management. Uh, so through a 24 year military career, most of the time was spent in either living within or creating administrative uh, issues and living within a bureaucracy. And so the military really embedded some aspects of, you know, how do you remember things? How do you utilize objects as memory objects? Uh, and there, I also had some traumatic experiences in the military. Uh, so I am considered a disabled veteran with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's another aspect of memory because with post-traumatic stress disorder, there are things that you just cannot forget no matter how much you want to. Uh, so that really starts to dig into what an archival memory is. So with memories themselves, it's really about experiences. And even when all of us share a collective memory, each of us have our own experiences. We each share the phenomena differently. So that's what my research has mostly been on for this entire uh, last two semesters is the experience of how we remember things, the different senses that we use to create memories. And of course, technical problems. So for this last year, I've uh, developed a umbrella organization called the Air National Mnemonic Object Registration Administration. Uh, it's a lot of big words, but basically it's a umbrella organization where we can deal with memories and objects and uh, upgrade an archival practice to register and preserve those memories or to preserve and protect those memories. Uh, the uh, motto of the organization is Immoralis Memoriae, Memoriae, which is immortality through memory. As long as people remember us, we keep living on, even if we're no longer on this corporeal plane. Uh, so part of creating this administrative oral function is how do you deal with red tape? And that, something that I think almost every adult on the planet has an experience with in some sort is bureaucracy. Uh, by the most of us, by the time we're 18 years old, have dealt with some sort of bureaucracy, either through schools, dealing with trying to get identification documents. Uh, so 
each of us can relate in our own way to bureaucracy and to red tape. So I've created, by creating the International Mnemonic Object Registration Administration, one of the first things I did was sat down and laid out the ground rules. So I created this Ministry of Mnemosign or the Ministry of Memories. Um, Mnemosign is the Greek tightness of memory. Uh, so I sat down and I laid out rules. It, it's almost like a game where each game has a rule, except for this tries to predict every possible outcome and using my military experience as a staff planner, try to lay out how to impact each or how to uh, transact each level. So this is a 46 page memorandum of instruction that covers uh, how to record memories, how to deal with memories, how to preserve memories, what to, how to uh, bring in memories from humans, non-humans, and even non-living objects, and how to protect those memories uh, at different security levels because some memories are more traumatic than others, some memories are more private than others. So it's a, a whole regulation essentially developed to protect memories. And these memories are preserved in multiple methods. But this particular image here, this is the Kodichi Memorial. Uh, inside this book of memories, I keep transcripts of the memories. I keep ekphrastic descriptions of the objects of memories. Uh, some memories are visual memories. So if there's a image that accompanies the memory, that's also included in the book. And then we actually record the physical object. So talking about the physical objects. So as I said, uh, it's a mnemonic object registration administration. So one, for me, one of my memory processes is called a haptic memory. Uh, I use objects to touch to recall memories. And I found that a lot of people, even if they're mostly visual remembers or if they're auditory or smell remembers, touch has a very special memory. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how using touch in the process of preserving memories is a critical part of this program. So when I developed this International Monarch Object Registration Administration and sub-agencies, the Ministry of Nemesign, and then the Ministry of Nemesign sub-agencies, the Memory Registration Commission, and the Office of the Remembrancer, I had to find ways to visually identify things. As a studio artist, visual identification is kind of a key element. So as you can see here in this image, I started off with a series of uh, wax seals, uh, different ways to identify if a memory was a routine or banal memory, an important memory, or even an official memory, such as a school function, a military event. Uh, and then there's also different levels of classification from top secret to secret and down to confidential or sensitive information. Part of this process too is a series of authentications and verifications that the memories are authentic memories. Uh, so we do a whole series of tracking systems in here. There's a dry stamp, there, each memory is serial numbered and every signature is authenticated. Uh, there is no signature in the entire process that somebody doesn't stamp to verify that it's either been witnessed or is their actual signature. So in this process, uh, this image right here is from the alpha stage. I adapted the product design system uh, of doing alpha testing, beta testing, and uh, initial rollout, and eventually the initial public offering. So alpha testing was mostly focused on myself. This is the process of trying to work all the initial bugs out before I brought in anybody else's memories to preserve them. The beta testing stage, I started to bring in other people's memories and I started to process non-human memories, trying to translate what a dog's memory might be or what a wisteria tree's memory might be in this time of uh, transition and this time of COVID. And so that led to the initial rollout, which was an exhibition held at Saatchi's Jules Madoff Gallery where we focused on trying to collect memories that related to life during the coronavirus pandemic. And I think that was very important because 
when you ask somebody to share a memory, throughout a lifetime, we accumulate so many memories that it can be difficult to pick one. So when you start to narrow the scope, it makes it a little bit easier for somebody to share a memory when they have a common base of knowledge. So now we're gonna start looking at the exhibition. So each desk had a function and a purpose. Uh, I set out to keep the, the desk to be cold, remote. Uh, the only touch of personality allowed on a desk was a coffee cup or a mug. Uh, part of this was to keep it so that this wasn't about the people working there, but it was about the people who were contributing their memories and to really make it about the people who are experiencing the space and not the people who are working in the space. And another focus was creating a bureaucratic aesthetic. In order to lend credence to the authority of an agency, you need to have a strong bureaucratic presence. So as you can see here, we turned this gallery into a office space. We had safety zones to keep people appropriately spaced apart. Uh, everybody had a function on their desk. You went to a specific place to accomplish a, spe a specific function. Uh, we did have the ability to rotate between desks. And for most of the exhibition, there were generally only one or two people working at a time. And in this time of remote work and telework, it was actually time relevant to uh, exploring the office in the coronavirus pandemic. So as part of the exhibition, when a visitor would come in after they booked an appointment online, I would give them a tour of the facilities because in order to share a memory, you need to feel comfortable with who you're sharing a memory with. So I would take guests through each stage and walk them through how their memories would be preserved show them the archives where their memories would be preserved before they would even come into the memory interview room to contribute a memory. I wanted to make sure that they were comfortable knowing that their memories would be preserved and that they would be protected. And so that they would feel like their memories were not being exploited, but it was actually taking their individual experiences to create a collective experience of sharing memories. The memory interview room was probably the most special place because that was the point of interaction between the participants as workers and the participants as memory imprinters and contributors. So you can see in this image here, even though there's a partition, it's an interaction. This is a space for the, the participatory process. And as a memory imprint would be in there, they'd be holding a mnemonic object and explaining their memory. And I would try to transcribe that memory. And one of the key elements of this is that this is the starting point of over 60,000 years of communication and memory preservation history. So we would take the oral traditions, we would take the written traditions and start this whole process of taking it from written to taking it to typed and transcribed and then taking images and fully processing it. So you had both a uh, auditory memory, you had the haptic memory of handling the object, and you had the visual memory of the experiences, as well as the sounds and the smells of the office. After the memory was properly recorded and printed, this was the final step for the participant, which was to uh, present their encryption device, which would be generally a fingerprint. Uh, for our non-human non -human participants, they would do other things with it, like a footprint or a leaf print, uh, depending on their type of non-human presence. Uh, but this is the final step in that, that haptic touch memory is leaving your mark because these marks are the tactile evidence of the objects you are handling. And hopefully someday when the technology becomes advanced enough, we can take these encryption keys where somebody had held an object and this imprint of their uh, fingerprints and be able to decrypt those memories and understand what the person was feeling as they were telling those memories. And then once the memory was imprinted and tran uh, 
transcribed, we would go through a whole series of authentications to preserve these memories. Uh, so through the use of stamps, through the use of signatures, through the use of certified individuals verifying everything along the way, we would create a certif certification of a mnemonic object, a certification of memory, a transfer of memory from the individual to the archive, and a certificate of authenticity so that you could eventually see that everything inside was authenticated, even though you can't actually see what's inside. So we would secure these memories with a wax seal. Everything is bound. Uh, and the objects themselves, the further down the line they went, became further and further withdrawn from our presence. So you're left with only the idea of the mnemonic object. I think that idea is the most powerful part because when you realize there is something there that now it may not have any intrinsic value. Nobody's putting in gold rings. Nobody's putting in a Rolex watch. These are all pieces, scraps of paper, the little bits of ribbon, but they have immense extrinsic value. And the amount of time that we went into to preserve these objects for them really increases the extrinsic value further and further until it, it's so precious that nobody should be able to handle it. So it's for here until the eventual destruction, the eventual entropy of things, uh, these objects will be preserved and protected within this archive of memories. Now one of the challenges with archiving memories is it's a impossible task. Uh, there's, we cannot preserve every single memory. We don't have that capability yet. So this is an attempt knowing that it's gonna be a failure. And I think that's the success of the problem of the project is by accepting that there will be failure, it allows us to combine humanity and bureaucracy into an artistic practice. So for the future of this project, uh, I'm trying to make it a mobile project. I'm trying to make it nomadic so that I can take it back to Oregon. I can go into future residencies. I can transform bits and pieces of it while still staying true to the core of the project. Uh, so right now we have a memory collection event, which is going to be occurring if we go into the orange zone from the 20th to the 23rd of April. Uh, if we go back into the orange zone also Chiazo Perduto will be hosting a memory collection event on the 24th of April. And hopefully as I go on the future residencies, my head back to the States, we'll be able to do more memory collection events or transform this into other lateral thinking projects. Uh, so if you'd like to participate, feel free to send me an email and uh, we can talk about doing a remote entry packet or we can talk about doing a postcard project, or I may be able to come to you and do a if you were willing to do a memory collection event, so we can do a communal community activity as a participatory art practice. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next up is Arreus. This is Arreus Meatyard, Metyard correctly. Um, she's in Kentucky right now. She's a Kentucky artist that works in playing with different forms of the narrative and the freedom of thought that comes from ambiguity. Okay. Thanks. All right. So my name is Arias Metchard. Hello, everyone. The main concepts among my work centers around awareness of the self, dualities through deconstruction of narratives and ambiguity. Within ambiguity lay gaps, censorship, theatrics, the blend of realism and abstraction, as well as the embodiment of nonsensical thought. The combination of these elements creates a dream world using aspects of playfulness and manipulation of different narrative forms. Integral here is the suggestion that narrative remains outside of logic and labels. This can be thought of in four different stages. The first, awareness of self in the world that at first glance appears natural or unspoiled. The second, discerning changes, transformations, growth and evolution, all of which can be positive or negative. 
the third, observing destruction and usurpation of humans by corporations or governments serving financial conquest. And the fourth, surveying the victors disguising their destruction as serving a greater good, which in all honesty is strictly self-serving. I use aspects of play with a keen intrigue into forming my own fables to show dichotomy of healing and destruction within these structures. These foundations transverse through multiple mediums, but the works I will be talking about today are strictly in the form of animation. They are Nothingness Conquered Them, Misericordia, and Insect Hunter. Nothingness Conquered Them. The animation begins with a representation of confined suffering and all the space of the known and unknown and the infinite dimensions of existence on this single planet, there is so much suffering, so much passivity. Nothingness Conquered Them is based on observation of religious freedom in areas of mass consumerism, where the consumers are not believers of religion, only profiteers. I pair this to areas of religious belief that are persecuted, murdered, and deleted by means of wars and genocides for being an unwanted narrative. This deletion of narratives the censorship of lives and histories, the non-allowance for those who differ from ourselves continues to end in the pool of blood. Silence through death seems to be the collective's only form of resolution in the removal of memory. My next animation is Misericordia. In Misericordia, I work in the duality of an upbringing immersed and pleased with nature as opposed to the consumption of the radiated screen. The first is in a time where a child must entertain themselves with what is available to them in nature and in the powers of their own imagination. The second is a time when the child is raised and saturated in the consumption of technology. This being the popular choice with fake importance. One's goal is to work on their own humanity and the other serves to commodify themselves. A play with the humanity of pieces to set the stage for internal destruction and questioning our perception of the natural. The irony is that I show this message in the digital dimension. The words spoken in the animation are from the manipulation of my mother's poetry. And lastly, Insect Hunter. Insect Hunter developed from my interest in investigating imagination rationality, chance, and disrupting the mind's ability to form a narrative, to experiment with the potential in creating a narrative that is disjointed and seemingly without purpose, yet through multiple viewings, connections can be formed. The animation is based on the founding principles of Dada with a surrealist attitude of automatism and the desire to create a work of art that has no obvious focal point of meaning. The present popular trend is for a work's worth to primarily come from its meaning. So I would like to make the work itself be the focus that stimulates independent thought. The aim is to enter the unconscious thoughts consciously. I must cast off the confines of reality while continuing to use the elements of reality to create my non-reality dream state. As another side to this, my animation confronts the reality and sanity of the world. Profit still remains the cause of war, not virtue. For if reality has deemed it good to go and murder people for no reason other than money and power, then it is better to cast off this reality and accept its sanity to become so-called insane. If the nonsense of the insane is on the side of being against an atrocious war and the accepted sane is to go and murder, then what is insanity? By depending on machines and technology, and destroying any life as a byproduct for the professed humanity of profit, humans are losing faith in themselves. My work is not anti-art, more like anti-reality or anti-forged normality. My perception may not be easily understood, but within this ambiguity, new things can be continuously seen. I work within the structure of time to show multiple perspectives in the destruction, revealing, and disruption of narratives awareness of self in the world, and creating a suspended place in a suspended time. The inclusion of playfulness or gentle beauty is an important element to counteract the aggressive undertones that are almost always within my work. Full on aggression renders one numb to it, 
the beauty must be shown for the expansiveness of feelings to culminate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reyes. Thank you. Um, the, some, some of these videos are going to be on the um, Sachi blog when the apprehensions of the material world are being posted, correct, Daria? So like Joe's and Arias's videos will also be seen. Yes. You'll get a chance. Everyone will like answer up. And um, American landscape. Okay, great. So when those are, everyone go to the blog, all attendees, when it'll be up in a couple of days and the show's happening. So you can actually see some of these videos in time. Which are beautiful, really mm. beautiful. Really nice to see. Um, our next up is Melissa Morris. Melissa uses the language of painting and drawing to explore the entanglement of matter and ideological constructions. She questions, how do our thoughts come to matter? Thank you, Kirsten. Hello, and thank you for being here. The title of my talk is, And the Grid's Heart Fluttered. My work for our final graduate show are paintings from a series entitled Undoing. In this talk, I'd like to tell you about how I arrived here. The work is a meditation on the systems we have created to make sense of the world and how they shape what we see and the world that we make. Through the medium of painting, I explore the question, how do our thoughts come to matter? My starting point was a phrase that I came across by the scholar and ecofeminist Donna Haraway. We have thrown the Cartesian grid over the world. This provocative phrase sparked my expo exploration of the grid as a structure of thought and its real world consequences. The grid is the emblem of modernity's faith in rational thought and unwavering belief in progress. It's a system for ordering built on the assumption that the world can be mastered through the use of geometry and the practice of measuring. So ubiquitous, it's sometimes hard to see. In our cities, the shapes of our houses and buildings. It's the frame through which we look at nature, the tiny pixelated grids of the image on the screen, the power grid, the internet, the form that our interactions take in these times of COVID. We have used the grid to map every inch of the earth and chart every phenomenon that we aim to control. Wondering how thoughts are entangled with material practices, I took Haraway's phrase and decided to make it real. I constructed a grid measuring a meter by a meter out of thin lines of black construction paper and threw it over everyday objects, art objects, in natural spaces, and at sites related to the history of humanism and the birthplace of linear perspective in Renaissance Florence. I wanted to interrogate the thinking that had blossomed at that time in Florence through playful interventions which also included interrupting the grid of the pavement at San Lorenzo Basilica with colored squares and shifting perspective with color. You'll see the importance of this in my work later in the talk. In my experiments, one of the most compelling aspects endlessly forming and reforming was the collapsing grid itself. It's normally flat, ordered, parallel lines, now bending and moving in space. As I photographed these experiments, placing them back into the frame of the grid, I kept returning to questions around the grid used in image making and by implication in world making. What is it doing and what might happen in its undoing? One point linear perspective is used particularly in European art since the early 1400s to translate a three-dimensional spatial world onto a two-dimensional flat surface. The invention of perspective relies on a single disembodied human eye in a fixed position looking through a window or grid at the world. It positions the human eye at the center of the man-made world and accounts only for what is seen by the eye and known through the sense of sight. 
It puts man at the center and reflects the rise of individualism in the Renaissance that continues unabated until today. My research into the grid and its implications are informed by posthumanist philosopher Rosie Bridotti's critique of humanism and the anthropocentric viewpoint. The notion of the human is captured in Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. Braidotti critiques this ideal as it imposes a set of values that leads to discrimination and exclusion. Looking at this image, one wonders who counts as human. That man is the measure of all things is highly questionable. The grid implies a measure based solely upon the eye leaving out forms of knowledge that come through other senses and even beyond the senses. It does not reflect the way we actually see and experience the world since we are not a single immovable disembodied eye. The grid is neither neutral nor objective. According to philosopher Karen Barad, measurements are intra-actions. The agencies of observation are inseparable from that which is observed. Measurements are world-making. Matter and meaning do not pre-exist, but rather are co-constituted via measurement interactions. Barad shows us that matter and meaning are entangled, undoing old ideas of the subject-object dichotomy and the possibility of being an outside observer. In three standard stoppages, Marcel Duchamp subverted this convention of material culture, the measuring system through its move into the system of art. He dropped three one meter threads onto three stretched canvases where they were then adhered in order to preserve the random curves they assumed upon landing. The canvases were cut along those curves, creating a template for new units of measure that retain the meter's length, but undermine its rational basis. Duchamp's new measure was one based on chance and on the various actants, such as the artist's body, the size and weight of the string, gravity, the air currents, and other unseen variables. My experiments in throwing the grid refer directly to Duchamp's paradigm shifting act. The modernist grid is sometimes described as that which separates art from life and what holds the contradiction between the values of the material and the spiritual. I place myself rather in the lineage of artists whose work are an entanglement of the real and the ideal, of the meaning in matter. Artists who have worked with the grid as a means to upend oppressive structures and question conventions with aspirations to create a better world and whose work evokes states of being that are beyond language. I work through the medium of painting because of its historical and material entanglement with the grid. The logic of the grid and its ways of measuring have contributed to the condition in which we find ourselves. One characterized by collapse and crises that have revealed deep imbalances in our relationship to each other and the planet. I wonder how might other practices and forms of thinking help us to reconfigure in ways that are more sustainable and contribute to the thriving of our living together. Undoing is a series of paintings that use the abstract language of art to explore the grid as a structure, to examine it as a thought form for our contemporary crises and to consider how it might be reconfigured. The grid in a state of undoing is a metaphor for our current condition. Rather than seeking to map predetermined human-centered perspective within its frame, I look to other principles for the line and composition. In my experiments, the element of chance enters in with each throw of the grid. The reconfigurations of the grid are based on the effects of gravity, the angle at which I throw it, the wind conditions, what it happens to land on, and other factors of which I'm unaware. But this participatory gesture is less willful, recognizing human agency is just one amongst a myriad of actants. The resulting forms have the potential to reflect a composition in which the human is neither at the center nor the sole creator. 
Painting offers the potential for creating spaces without the use of perspective, but rather through color. I work with a complementary pair of colors, shifting their tonality, luminosity, and saturation in order to explore how the different qualities of the colors and their interactions create a range of thought forms, a new logic to build on. I consider color a form of thinking. At the boundaries where the colors meet, they sometimes disappear and at other times vibrate, inviting prolonged looking and also creating an experience in which the image cannot be fixed in the eye. The large scale of the works invites the knowing that comes through the body as well as the mind, both in their making and in their viewing. They are abstract dynamic systems with their own nature and logic and remain open to the viewer's participation and interpretation. The different iterations hint at the endless possibilities with the play of a few elements. They suggest ongoing processes rather than fixed states. In some immeasurable way, the color and form act upon us. I borrowed the title of this research from a book by Jane Bennett, in which she describes a major blackout across North America caused by the failure of the power grid, similar to the recent ones in Texas, and references an article which describes the blackout with the phrase, and the grid's heart fluttered. I chose this title in order to emphasize the idea that while the paintings are abstract in that they don't represent objects, they are about real things and real events in the world. In bringing the collapse of the power grid into the work through its title, I am making a link between the act of throwing the grid over nature and the result of that kind of domination, blackouts and grid failure. Anthropomorphizing the grid in this way, giving it a heart that flutters is a way of pointing toward the inadequacy of understanding the grid simply as a machine or a tool, as a series of fixed parts organized from without that serves an external purpose. The parallel in my work is that I'm reimagining the grid in light of the knowledge that comes through art's language of line, color, and composition. The paintings propose that the grid isn't flat, is more flexible than we think, and could come to encompass other systems and forms of knowledge, part of a larger collective contribution to repatterning our ways of being in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, David. Uh, David Neal is an adopted Peruvian American interdisciplinary artist currently residing in Florence, Italy. Neil's work, rooted in his own experience, addresses inequality, surveillance, and control, and is a critique of institutional power. You can start, David. All right. Thank you, Kirsten. There we go. Okay, excellent. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Again, yes, my name is David Neal. And my work addresses inequality, surveillance and control using installation, uh, photography, and performance in order to critique institutional power. These institutions uh, play an important role in society to assist communities by administering facilities and programs that promote learning. Artists and thinkers are taking action to decolonize institutions and have shed light on the drawbacks. Now I'm interested in how institutional powers give access and control to a person's visibility and identity. Who has access and who does not? Are these pathways uh, to access equal? The US uh, education system still follows outdated standardized learning systems and teaching practices that are not equitable to students with uh, learning disabilities or BIPOC students. Uh, in my work, I address these issues raising questions as to how we might break from these outdated systems. 
I utilize a narrative with elements of a dark humor, um, as well as somewhat humiliating interactions between student and teacher within institutional structures. Uh, within my practice, I use material uh, for their symbolic value. Khaki textile buttons and school supplies are potentially the starting points, connecting my concerns to wider issues within uh, new materialism, institutional critique, and decolonization in the contemporary art world. Uh, so blackboard is a large piece of paper painted uh, with blackboard paint to resemble the classroom blackboard. Rather it being a uh, smooth surface, it is disrupted by being crumpled. So the performative gesture addresses the flaws of the education paradigm. It also purposely challenges um, to write a straight line on the blackboard because um, of, the, of the surface. And there are two uh, sentences in cursive in both English and Italian. Uh, they are pengrams. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And uh, malavolpe col suo balzo abrigiunto uh, il quieto fido. Now accompanying the blackboard is also this work titled Just Sit Still. And both of these boards are an important tool for the teacher because they allow the students to have visual aids uh, for the lesson plans, you know, the in-class and homework assignments, and to exchange uh, information to their peers. Uh, for me, this has been a helpful resource because I am both a visual and um, tech kinesthetic learner. And the phrase, uh, just sit still, it's been a repeated command um, by teachers uh, since elementary school. Uh, this one's connecting to um, a story when my second grade substitute teacher um, had enough of me uh, fidgeting and moving around. Yeah, even right now I am standing rather than sitting down um, to calm my nerves. Uh, but having enough of me being disrupting, um, she approached me, grabbed me by the shirt and just yelled like, you shut your big mouth as well as like telling me to sit still in class. Uh, so the phrase becomes this target of uh, thrown crumpled wads of paper uh, dipped in acrylic paint, mimicking how the commoner throws uh, tomatoes or mud at the guilty in the pillories or at performers through the surrealist theater. Uh, the marks on the canvas, they cover parts of the vinyl lettering and the directive and my performative actions begin to take away that authority's command. Now, um, I see these two works, they being in dialogue with uh, Adrian Piper's um, work, Adrian Everything 21, because um, using the visual teaching tool as a fundamental in the classroom. And what she states is, um, she thinks that it's a way of reaffirming the transience of everything that we do not anchor in stable relationships of trust it is also part of the yoga practice to practice detachment and to look at any possession, any object, any situation as a part of that transient process with which one cannot identify too closely because it is not really a part of the deep person, the deep self that each person has inside them. And this is uh, one of the four uh, blackboards to use with the sentence, everything will be taken away, uh, repeated 25 times. And um, in the style, uh, it's like a school punishment. Since the late 1990s, the United States Department of Education urged public schools to adopt the school uniform into their dress code policy as an approach to reduce school violence and instill discipline. However, there is an idea that the uniform neutralizes the student's self-expression and personal identity, as well as being unaffordable to low-income families. Now, I chose khaki fabric um, as a base to create these student portraits, um, scorching them with fire at three points, uh, creates these like psychological expressions, mainly whether the student is 
not having a good day. They're not understanding the classwork um, to the point that it disrupts this grid system as this arrangement similar to desks. Uh, now, looking at the image, there is one missing, um, tends to be one that does not and does not want to be there. So they ditched the class. Um, this is also just mirrors with that arrangement of the rows of desks. And the arrangement is both advantageous and disadvantageous uh, for the teacher and student. Um, it minimalizes that student, student, student to student communication and does not nurture collaboration. For the teacher, there is that stronger communication with students in the front, but it becomes difficult to interact with the students sitting in the middle or the back rows. Now this work classroom series, um, it draws a, it's a, it's a diagram classroom from an aerial point of view and it is a diptych that shows the power dynamic of authority versus the crowd, as well as its reversal. Um, the compositions made of the buttons are based on the type of classroom desks and table orientation typical in American classrooms. Uh, the instructor is represented as red buttons and the students are shown as khaki buttons. Uh, red emphasizes the role of authority, whereas khaki emphasizes the role of the crowd. However, when the student plays uh, the authoritative role, they obstruct the teacher's uh, path to get to the front of the classroom. There is both a harmonious and divisible relationship between the instructor and student, like a button fastening two articles of clothing together and separating them. So, um, so one day in high school, um, I was sitting in the front row in class and uh, my high school teacher uh, was talking and all of a sudden her partial dentures fell out and landed on my desk. It was so sudden and then processing what had happened. In the meantime, many students were laughing and <laughs> it was a difficult situation. Um, however, the teacher kept her composure by trying to dismiss the incident uh, while she was masking her shame and vulnerability. And at the end of the day, um, it was not mentioned again. And I found that interesting um, how this was a moment of empathy as well as an example of victim victimizer and observer roles. The, craft, the classroom is a space where both teachers and students may battle for control. Uh, they play a part in the teacher and student relationship. Uh, the work is titled A Relic of an Authority's Vulnerability and it conveys this dynamic. When the dentures fell out of the teacher's mouth, this also unmasked her authoritative role. It's similar to when this person is embarrassed to smile or show their teeth, possibly due to poor hygiene, braces, or injuries. I feel that teeth are an important role, as well as a surviving tool that displayed this hierarchical role in society. The psychology behind these barely white teeth is a display of status and affordability for health insurance. Yet people tend to hide the or wear false teeth in order to fit in with society. And I also feel these partial dentures are another form of a mask. Uh, they're placed inside that bell jar, which sits on top of the pedestal, elevating the status of the object. And then behind it is this yellow wall that I feel symbolizes that apprehension and discomfort. Uh, this image um, and this persona is called Mr. Gobbledygook. Um, he is a troublesome teacher that wears a, a mask quite similar to the previous work of the students, though this one also includes um, the button dent teeth from the previous work of the relic. Mr. Gobbledygook is a disruptive, unorganized, and nonsensical teacher. He would be the one to skip the lesson like the student ditching class. He does not have a planner or notes on his desk and teaches the course by ear. When he is lecturing, he makes noises and blurts random words, expecting the student to understand it. 
And I developed this persona based on my interactions and observations with those dispassionate teachers in high school. In the performance, stepping out of class, Mr. Gabi decides to skip the lesson and walk around the streets in Florence. Uh, this persona is exposed to the public space and I was expecting a reaction. He passed by a group of police, for example, police officers, and rather than being approached and questioned, uh, Mr. Gabi walked past them as they stared. During this 45 minute walk, people either ignored or did a double take when seeing him. The defiant teacher then tends to continue this performance by taking an hour walk equal to a typical length of a class and will eventually grow into several hours equaling an entire school day. And during my studies at Saatchi, I was introduced to the work of Adrian Piper. Like I said before, she is an American conceptual artist and philosopher who grew up in Manhattan in an upper middle class black family and attended a private school which mostly wealthy, with mostly white, wealthy and white students. In Adrian Piper's The Mythic Being, she embodies her male alter ego and wears an Afro wig, reflective sunglasses and a mustache while roaming the streets of New York. Piper began manifesting this persona monthly when she first published a photographic advertisement of the mythic being with a thought bubble in the newspaper the New York newspaper, The Village Voice. The selected passages inside the thought bubble were personal thoughts taken from her teenage journals, repeatedly, repeatedly chanting these mantras during her performances. Onlookers hear and question her behavior. And she is not fully aware of their gaze because she concentrates on the repeating the passage. The concept of the performance is the person's perception of a particular identity, specifically a working class black male. Uh, in the end, I know I do not right at the moment have the answers to how we can change or progress forward to uh, other, way, other means of our education system. However, I feel like my work addresses what has been going on for these last decades. And as well as sharing my experiences and opening up, I feel that maybe people can empathize, experience, or have witnessed these moments in the, during their time at school. And I hope that people now can also empathize that we are not just these objects in that line in the factory. Now, we all have these different learning strategies. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, what we'd like to do now is we're, we're very lucky. We've got 22, to be precise, minutes till we sign off. And um, Reagan, who's been on the ground with them in the studio this past year, is going to ask um, some questions. But we'd also, in the meantime, also welcome, there's a little Q&A button, or what is it, DNR, or what is it, DNA at the bottom in Italian? Um, Q&A at the bottom of your screens, attendees. So you also, if you want to um, pop in a question while we're beginning, we can, great, we can start that now. And we'll see we have time for all of them at the end. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, everybody. I know, we know it's difficult to condense two years of research into a brief, um, brief introductions of your work. But um, I wanted to ask you, we want to leave time, obviously, as Kirsten said, for the people in attendance to ask you specific questions, since we obviously know your work very well. Um, but I wanted to start off with a few questions. I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question, maybe some of you can answer, um, and then we'll allow the participants to ask, and I may come in with, with other questions sort of peppered throughout. Um, I want to first ask you to think about, maybe tell us a little bit more specifically about the title of the exhibition, Apprehensions of the Material World, and what you feel your work, um, how your work speaks to this. Um, specifically thinking about that apprehension 
can mean anxiety and fear, and it can also mean understanding. Who would like to speak first? I think that's an open question for all of you. Okay, well, I will begin. <laughs> so in the context of my work, I would say, especially dealing with an insect hunter or other work that I haven't shown, it's mainly in the act of censorship. And it would be apprehensions towards how we view reality, how our reality is shaped, and how we are expected to be in reality when that reality isn't as reality appears. So. In that way, that can be deemed as the apprehensions in the material world. I think we should all have a chance to speak. So who wants to go next? All five of you, if you want to all respond to that. I'm just gonna go on my screen. Joe, go, if you'd like to say yeah, something. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, in regards to the exhibition specifically and my work American Landscapes within that, I think the apprehensions come into play with specifically viewing, um, in this case, cinema and understanding and also being a bit anxious about, you know, what is being kind of there, what is left over. And I know within my work in particular, um, there tends to be anxiety based in what will be forgotten in the future and always kind of being in this unknown future. Um, but then at the same time, how that can be kept safe. And so within the specific work, there's this, this kind of fear and anxiety within even how things that are representable get contextualized later on. But then how, is it, is it one too late to then recenter and rethink and, and kind of examine something in a different way? Or then at the same time, how can this be addressed, made clear, then progress forward? David, would you like to respond? You can pass too if you don't want oh, to. No, I was just gathering my thoughts. Um, I feel that uh, many of the work, my works using the uh, khaki textile um, based off its like, history from colonization back in the late 1800s, as well as now how it's transitioned uh, to uniform, military uniform, school uniform, and then like the uh, retail uniform. Uh, and with my experience with that, uh, how this, this, this color and this material is supposed to help us uh, have a form of control as well as to block away like gang violence, for example. And it's supposed to maintain this like, uh, what is it, discipline. And I think for the apprehensions, uh, it is this anxious, color based off its history and what it's used now. Eric, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, for me, the apprehensions, uh, it's like the in the question, apprehension is two parts. So one is the anxiety portion. And so in my work, I try to capture the anxiety of losing memories but also by creating a participatory practice. Right now we have so much anxiety from the lack of physical contact, the lack of being in a shared space uh, because of the, the Zoom environments where this is most of our interaction. Uh, so that, that creates anxiety for me. But also on the understanding, the apprehend part, trying to capture these memories before they're lost. Uh, and by sharing this experience, it creates a sense of empathy and a sh it creates shared memories between people. So these memories can stay beyond in a immaterial fashion, uh, even though we're using material objects as the memory transfer process. Hmm. Mel, Melissa? Um, yes, I, I really like this title, I have to say, because I think it really captures um, the apprehension that we all feel because of the uncertainty around, around COVID and this time that we're living, the collapse of structures, the injustices that are being revealed. 
And at the same time, the, the privilege of being an artist and the possibility to work through materials, to actually work with those fears, shape, and even shape new possibilities, new forms, shifting thoughts through, through making things. I think it's a, it's a very powerful and effective tool for that. I also just want to add that as Reagan asks a couple more questions, we really welcome any of you attendees to use the Q&A. So um, plug in a question if you want to while we're talking. Go ahead, Rex. Um, I wanted to address this, the, um, the nature of how it is you've worked together over the last two years. And you've worked, you've all, as we've just seen in your presentations, carried out intensive artistic research, um, making massive shifts in your work in these two years, but you haven't done it alone. You've done it also as a collective. And I, you've done it in the physical studios of Saatchi and in the virtual space of Zoom. And I wanted to ask each of you if you would like to respond to the, I, the what it is you've experienced as artists individually in your practice and the influence of this collective that you've worked within on your practice. Who'd like to respond first? I can start. Um, I have to say that immediately makes me think about the conditions um, that were set from the beginning in our working together, which was really creating that you, you created, the professors created a sense of uh, collaboration with the open studio spaces and the, the common group reviews and critiques that we had often, where we are encouraged to, um, you know, learn from each other, help each other with each other's work and how it was reading, was it clear? So there was not ever a sense of, of competitiveness. It was the sense of each person has something, an important thing to contribute. And I think that setting that from the very beginning has just created really a sense of um, community that we all feel. And we, we learn so much from each other and discuss that a lot. And it's, it's such a great privilege to have to be able to to step inside someone's practice and really see what they're doing and what they're thinking, and uh, it's it's been an incredible two years. So thanks to you all. It's interesting as you're talking because one of the questions is is hearing the presentations in the Q and A. I'm struck by the connections and the interrelationships between the different art projects. Was this by design? So we're sort of answering um, this question indirectly, but if others of you would like to uh, talk as well. I would like to respond for this as well. Um, I think, you know, for me having this, this new perspective and, and in, in kind of way of setting up this, this um, you know, collaboration or even in a way of, of a discussion within an art context and the way the studios were set up is, is completely life-changing. I mean, even in terms of changing my own perspective on how one looks at their own practice or what they do, um, I think it's become really um, important in how I recognize, how I transfer ideas, that discussion is so much a part of how I've developed my work here for the last two years, that between my colleagues and really friends just even talking about the works that I have in process has helped shape what ends up at the end and what it becomes and even where I look forward to going um, within my works. And I think it's in this, this group effort, this collectiveness, this way of mixing ideas and perspectives that really helps formulate these really strong works that are all in a way connected, but again, our own unique voices and our own individual ideas. And there's these conceptual threads that are woven through all of it. And I think that's really amazing. It's interesting, the interconnections and also the complete differences, the individualities that are um, evident in everyone's work. Would the other three like to say something? Should we just go with every question? Eric, you wanna say something? You're next on my screen. Uh, I would just say, you know, talking about that interweaving, it's, you know, our, our cohort created a tapestry of 
each of us having our own individual practices, we definitely shared ideas, we shared projects. Um, and that's, and Joe and I shared a wall for the first semester and a half. Arreus and I shared a, a zone, you know, David and I shared community space. And each of us shared spaces, each of us shared ideas. And like Melissa was saying, that that lack of competition, because the, you know, we weren't looking for who's gonna be valedictorian or who had the highest GPA. It was a sense of community and mutual support that uh, I think brought us all into sharing ideas and uh, sharing our artistic practices and each of us helping each other grow and each of us supporting. It's a mutually supportive institution. So that um, it may not have been intentional, but we all grew together and all support and all uh, inspired each other. David, do you want to add? You can pass. I, I'm going to pass because. Okay. <laughs> 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 Would you like to hear what, been said, what needs to be said been said? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, it's interesting because actually, Reagan, can I ask one of these questions that are on the Q, Q and A? Uh, because in that question, it's interesting, has the forced disconnect um, changed your project and research? I'm assuming this means the pandemic and the fact that we've been remote. For me, it changed a lot. I went from being a very object-oriented artist, uh, dealing with physical objects to becoming very conceptual because our whole world became conceptual. That, that lack of physical interaction between each other created this conceptual space. But I think it made the work stronger. I think it made what we did, you know, we had to think about what we were doing instead of just doing something. So, it definitely changed things, but I think it made all of us work together to be stronger artists. I think that it, um, I'm not sure that it really changed the nature of the work, but I think it changed for me. Um, it actually helped me focus. It helped me go much deeper into the work. And it's hard to say what would have happened had we not lived through COVID, how the work would be, but I, I do feel um, in fact, moving, even though we were, we were still connected remotely, but moving into my own studio space, having a small space and just having to really focus and then really wanting to do something physical, wanting to paint and wanting to, to really work through the material. I think all those things were, were certainly a product of, of what was happening. Yeah, I think, um, I don't necessarily know if I would make what I've made now um, during this period, if, if it was in uh, the other circumstances, but I think it, um, at the end of the day, would just be hypothetical at that. I think the I, what was really central is this, this concept that the center of my work was there since I think day one entering the studio at Saatchi. Um, and it was being discovered in other works in this, in this tactile approach to things, but now being in a, a displaced period and one rather suddenly really changed how I thought about my own practice as well. And also allowed me to consider what I really like and what I like to do and how maybe there's different outlets for my, my practice that can come forward now maybe than before. But that this period of, of solitude and isolation I think actually ended up fostering a lot of my practice and, and, and aiding in it because of this you know, this time of research and contextualization and also just learning and being open to and taking in everything that's happening around it. So in a way, I think it's actually uh, and allowed me to take in more to understand and to just sit with everything happening and then how it can feed into my practice. Hmm. Hmm. Anything else that other people want to say about that? Um, I, I don't particularly think it changed my project or research that much um, in that terms of ideas or what I was interested in making art on, but it really helped me to go further into the ideas. And also just because I came back to Kentucky, there's more space here and I was able to do more things in terms of creating the animations 
because there were more possibilities in filming it, or there, there were just more resource, resources in using different dyes for my paper or doing larger projects and that kind of thing versus if I had been still stuck in my apartment in Italy, then <laughs> everything would have been much smaller in scale and minimal. Hmm. David, do you want to say anything? Or we can go to the next question. David? Uh, I'm, I was just gathering my thoughts again, uh, the process. Well, I, yeah, at the very beginning of the whole pandemic, I, def I feel like my work has definitely changed. Um, having to make quick works, uh, simple designs yet there is this story behind it both uh, like an autobiographical but then also um, something that's more social and like political i feel um i know like if the what if scenario like if this did not happen um i feel like it would be later on uncovered uh but because of this um and this push of like needing to see these visuals right away um, help strengthen that during this um, pandemic. I'm reading right now some questions. Um, how do you believe this engagement with uncertainty, apprehension and the unknown and the works you produced on the basis of your organic thoughts, intellectual pursuits and lived experiences during the overlapping periods of COVID social contestation and collapse of the human nature relation required this triple crisis? Or rather, what would you have produced perhaps if this were a tranquil and peaceful period? <laughs> hmm. Interesting question. Well, um, honestly, if this pandemic and everything weren't happening, I still think my topics would have been the same because a lot of it deals with war or how we view the natural and being in technology, which was already increasing dramatically without actually then being forced to be in technology. So I, I think I was going in that direction anyway. This just kind of was like, yeah, do it. <laughs> Uh, I think for me, it, it changed a lot of how I was positioning myself within my projects. Like to give an example, the work Never Saw or Sad that I presented was in the free process of starting out as a film. It was going to be a documentary and it was going to be more an artistic documentary, but in a more, I think, linear fashion than what it's ended up at. So this work was started before the pandemic and now having been created through it, I don't, I don't think it's related necessarily to it specifically in the, in, the, in the context, but you know, having been displaced back home, being able to communicate one-on-one -on -one with my mom, discuss the memories, discuss these, this family history that I didn't know, it did shape how I was looking at it and it became clear what the result should be, you know, to make it into these trailers and to put it online. It's the same with the Midnight Drive. I, I was curious about how to make something open for all because exhibition spaces weren't open. There wasn't an, a way to safely navigate uh, the art world at the time. And that anxiety that came with that for me or that uncertainty of what would to happen, you know, started questioning how can works be produced in a different way or how can you put something online or out for all to experience without necessarily sacrificing the artwork at the same time. So I think it's contributed to definitely my uncertainty within everything and how I look at things, but also changed how I was thinking about even displaying work, showing them or producing them. Yeah, I would just say, I like, I like what Araya said about it sort of propelled you to, to speak out or gave you, and I just think of the word courage. I feel like somehow it gave me courage to do these big paintings. <laughs> I'm not sure I would have done otherwise. Uh, for me, had it been yeah, a tranquil, peaceful period, um, I was still focusing on like institutional power, mainly like the humiliation and like another branch, uh, more of like security and that sort of control, having like this uh, 
dark humor version of like uh, like the TSA, for example, and using like uh, like those invisible dog leashes, but with barbed wire and creating these barriers to kind of disrupt this uh, um, path to go to the gallery, which was this idea installation for the, the group show. Um, but I, it was more like what materials could I have used uh, was not fully like polished. And because of this, uh, the pandemic and where everything I started researching, I mean, I now found that material for the barriers for like other, the, the uniform, the outfit. Um, so that just also fit in a, like another piece of the puzzle for that work. Um, but again, yeah, it's, uh, it still would be focusing on that and uh, being aware of that. You wanna say something, Eric? I was just gonna say, it's, because of how much change, I couldn't possibly hypothesize what I could have done if it was peaceful and tranquil. You know, we've lost out on a year of interactions with you know, hundreds of undergraduate students. We've lost out on a year of experiencing Florence and the art exhibition. So it's, it, it's impossible to know what we could have done or what we would have done differently. Uh, so it's just, this is how we adapt and we overcome and we keep producing because we're artists. And that's, we sit down and we sketch or draw or write or interact in our own ways just to keep moving forward. Mm, that's a nice thing to end at the time, at the end of our time. <laughs> um, it's, I just wanna say there's one last comment. Hearing your comments, you should each contribute to Eric's memory archive. This is not a question. <laughs> Don't worry, I think we all have. You must all as attendees contribute to it as well. And um, I want to also um, emphasize that we'll be posting the um, information for the exhibition on the blog. So you should be checking that out soon. So you can see more and read a bit more about their work and see some of the videos. Um, let's see on Friday, third, you know, Saturday morning, if you're able to come, those of you who are in town. Um, and I really, really, really want to thank you all, my, the panelists and the attendees for being here. Is there any last words that anyone wants to say <laughs> before we sign off? Just a thanks also to Steve, sorry. Yes, I want to say thank you to Steve, yeah. I didn't say anything that uh, contributed, but I wanted to just point out how much I appreciate the, the honesty and the authenticity in the work of all of you, because um, for this particular group, I think it might be the collaboration and there's definitely a consistency and a, sh and a shared set of ideas here, perhaps about challenging the constructs of society and um, questioning that. And you all did that in your own unique way, but you also seem to do a tremendous amount of research and you really interrogated what you did in a way that gives substance to what you've produced. And I think that you should really be commended for that. The other thing that stands out for me, <clears throat> excuse me, is the, um, the quality of the making and your artistic projects, your aesthetics as artists here, your artists visualizing and expressing com complex ideas and the mediums with which you used and the means of expression and your own personal expressions came through in a very profound way, I'm a, you know, in all the different uh, forms of expression, whether it's painting or photography or animations. Um, and, you know, I think that we, we talk about these, these big ideas and, and the challenges we are facing today through, through the eyes of artists. And I think you've all done a tremendous job doing that. And, and um, I just wanted to commend you for that. Thank you. Thank you, students. Thank you, soon to be graduates. Countdown. They've got their GRB next week and then graduation. <laughs> also, thank you, Daria and Reagan, as well, for everything. Is there any last any last words? Anything else to say? <laughs> That's our last word. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you.
soon in the realm. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Grazie. Bravi. Molto Thank bravi. Grazie. <laughs>